Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lectures. Um, today I wanted to do a very short video uh, about how to do data analysis with graphs and specifically I'm looking at how to obtain the equation of the period of a pendulum using the graphs of the data um, for the pendulum. So in order to um, get everybody on the same page, I've constructed here a sort of simple pendulum. It basically consists of a small, um, thin, lightweight string. Ideally, the mass of the string is zero. And then some pendulum bob at the end where most of the mass is contained. And the basic properties of this pendulum are that the vast majority of the mass is contained down here in the pendulum bob, which consists of a couple of well, a set of washers. And um, that the pendulum bob itself is very small compared to the length of the string. So the diameter of the bob is a few times um, shorter than the length of the string. So basically what we wanted to do here is get the period um, of motion for this pendulum as a function of several variables. Now I'm not going to actually do the whole experiment here because the point of the video is not this experiment. The point of the video is actually how to do data analysis from the graphs, um, from the data that would be collected from this experiment or an experiment like it. But I wanted to give everybody some context before um, getting into that part of the video. Now the period of the pendulum is the time that it takes for it to complete a whole swing. So I pull the bob back, I release it, swings back to my hand. The amount of time that um, it took for it to go there and then back to here, that amount of time is one period. So basically you can imagine doing a set of experiments um, to figure out what this period depends on. So what are some possible uh, parameters that we can be investigating here? Um, I, I want to give a moment for you to think for yourself and name them out, but I'll go ahead and write those down uh, here. So the independent variables for this experiment can include the mass of the uh, pendulum or pendulum bob uh, could include the length of the string or really the length of the pendulum to the center of mass but we'll call it the length of the string uh, so we'll use an L for that uh, could be the initial displacement so initial displacement is basically how far back I pull it um, and that could either be as a linear distance or as an angular uh, distance. So the initial displacement would be either delta x or delta theta initial. And then the other possible independent variable, albeit one that I don't have a very good way of changing terrestrially, is uh, how much does gravity pull on the bob? So call it the gravity uh, field strength. So gravity field strength, also known as free fall acceleration g. Okay, so those are some possible independent variables. And basically what you want to do is systematically go testing each of these um, independent variables. So for example, I could be testing out the um, effective displacement first. So maybe one time I pull like this and time it, one time I pull like this and time it, one time I pull out like this and time it. I should say that you want a small angular displacement for this, so anything more than maybe 10 or 15 degrees is kind of pushing our luck a little bit. Um, but you time each one of those and essentially get the period, get the um, displacement value. I could also do versus length. So 
you know, I could change the length of the string. So here's a relatively short string, and then here's a relatively longer string. So now we're looking at like this long, and basically want to time it uh, for one period here. I could change the mass by taking washers off or putting washers on. Gravity field strength I can't actually change, but in the event that I could, you know, how do you change that? Well, um, you could, for example, do this in a jet plane that is set up to go in free fall um, or less than free fall. And so that kind of sort of simulates changing the gravity field strength in the same way that getting on an elevator and accelerating up or accelerating down changes your apparent weight. So in some sense, this gravity field strength is sort of linked to apparent weight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a set of data, some of which I've collected and then some of which I've had to simulate, and start plotting and then explaining what each of the plots means. All right, so I'm going to pause this because you don't want to watch me like do the whole experiment in real time. That would be... Um, you know, maybe you should do that yourself, honestly, rather than watching me do it. But let's pause and see what happens. All right, so now I've collected some data for my simple pendulum um, in which I've varied the mass, the length, and the displacement. Um, and basically, I uh, let it oscillate 10 times while timing it recorded the time for those 10 oscillations, and then divided that number by 10 to get an average period. Okay, and one thing to note, I did recycle some data. It's okay to do that. Um, I have, as my basic controls, a default length of 3 quarters of a meter, a default displacement of about 6 degrees, which comes out to apparently this many um, uh, radians. Uh, I have obviously free fall acceleration of 9.8 meters per second and then my default mass is 35 grams or 0 0.035 kilograms. That is uh, basically each one of these little washers is 7 grams and I happen to have five of them on here as my default. So I've taken 10 data points for each of these different independent variables now what we want to do is go ahead and plot them. So uh, how to make a plot, and this is kind of important. There's sort of two options for you if you're going to do this as a valid lab plot. Uh, option number one is you can do it by hand, in which case you need to use graphing paper. A hand plot does not mean take a piece of college ruled or wide ruled or whatever note paper and sketch axes. Those are not going to be very good axes. Even if you use a ruler, they're not going to usually be as good of an axis as what you're going to get using graph paper. So if you're going to do it by hand, then use graph paper and make your scales. The other option is to do it on computer, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'm using LibreOffice Calc. You could also use Excel. You could also use any number of other graphing um, Programs. I think uh, I think Demos or whatever is, is one of the more popular ones. There's uh, there's like a Python Plotter. There's uh, plotting packages in C and Java and so on. You could use MATLAB. You could use Maple. You could use Octave, etc. I'm doing this on Excel though because or, or on a LibreOffice Calc because. I have it and it's easy. So for me to do a plot, the way that this works is you put in a chart and we always want to do an XY scatter plot for these kinds of data. And then to uh, basically graph it, what you do is you get your series and you can select your X and Y values. So my X value is my independent variable, the mass. My y value in this case is the dependent variable that is the um, average period. And then, of course, you always want to put 
like labels and titles and all that. So this is uh, period versus mass uh, for a uh, let's say pendulum of length uh, 0.75 meters and initial displacement uh, 0.105 radians or 3 degrees. Uh, and then x-axis, this is where I plotted mass, so you need to give it the label um, and units in kilograms. The y-axis was period, and that is in seconds. And I guess more properly, this is the average period, um, so you could I call it that as well. All right, so here is what that scatter plot looks like, and boy, it looks really scattered, except for that if you look closely at the y-axis, it has zoomed very much in. So what I would maybe want to do here is change the scale of my axis. I'm going to go ahead and force a minimum of zero on this. Um, so when you zoom out that way, you can see that they're scattered, but the thing that's going to fit them best is going to be something like a horizontal line. They fit very nicely along a horizontal line. And since I'm not plotting anything else here and don't want to have to write all of the parameters, I'm going to delete that part of the key. Um, so that is how you make a graph. I'm going to do that for the other two, but before I do, I will mention that if you get a horizontal line, the conclusion is that there is no relationship. So let's copy this over here, let's put it here, and I'll write my conclusion next to it. Um, period does not depend on uh, mass or on the mass of the pendulum for a simple pendulum. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause again because you don't want to have to watch me do that whole process a second time and I'll put the graphs for the other two things in. Alright, so we've got our plot of period versus initial displacement here and um, again looks like pretty much a horizontal line so um, as with this one, so with this one, period doesn't depend upon initial displacement. Again, we know this because when we've plotted the data, it falls along more or less a horizontal line whose main deviations are due to my reaction time. So now let's look at the last of the uh, plots. And that last plot is, of course, the period versus length. And for this one, we now see that this uh, period versus length is not a horizontal line. You can see that we're zoomed out here. Um, and if you look closely at it, you can actually see that it's not really linear either. Um, I'd have to pull open a different program to show that. So if I pull open the LibreOffice drawing um, and I uh, grab this graph and put it into that drawing then if I wanted to draw a straight line oops, uh, from say here through the first data point and try to get it through the others maybe they line up maybe they don't I should add that for an idealized uh, simple pendulum if the length goes to zero, then the amount of time that it takes to complete an oscillation should also go to zero. And so that means that there's actually a stealth data point down here, and you can see that that really doesn't fit along this line. Now with that said, it's kind of difficult to see that this is not actually a line with some wiggle to it. And the reason for that is because, again, we have reaction times. And that's part of why it's good to take so many different data points. If I'd only taken like three of these data points, 
then I'm going to be able to do a pretty good job of fitting a line of best fit to them regardless of whether it's linear or nonlinear. Okay, so seeing as this is not linear, and if I zoom in on it a little bit, you can see that, yeah, it deviates quite a bit from this line um, compared to, say, one of the others. Uh, if, I, if I pull, again, this guy right here and put it in, let's send this to the back. If I take my line a best fit here and say this is a horizontal line, this lines up pretty well, comparatively speaking. Okay, so let's uh, let's put this one back because there's something else I want to do um, with it, and that is that I want to try to determine what kind of graph it is. So one way of doing that is that I can add another column here for squaring an axis. So Let's say that this is the period squared um, and see what happens. So this is now in seconds squared. Um, this part, I'm just simply going to use the equation editing ability of Excel uh, or of LibreOffice to do um, what I'm going to do. And I'm going to just recreate the graph here, relabel it. It's going to be now linearized and so of course this is now average period oops squared um, and in second squared so I have to change the axis label as well as the title and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the um, column that I've selected for your my data to this column here. Never mind the significant figures. This is what this graph now looks like. Um, so I've changed from this to this. And to double down on this point of is it linear now or was it linear before, let's go ahead and put it in here and see if we can get a line of best fit for these data. So we'll even start down here at 0, 0 and come along the data like this. You can see that this line fits these data better than this line did. And that's because over here what we actually had was a sideways parabola. Down here now we have actually a straight line. All right, so and notice that my axis um, values have also changed because of this squaring. Okay, so what I want to do is go back into Excel and I want to add a trend line. So insert trend line. And I want to show the equation on the um, chart, although I could also pull the equation some other way. And um, I can force the intercept, it doesn't matter. If I don't force the intercept, it'll change this equation very little. So see this intercepts at 0 0.025 uh, and I'm going to go ahead and make these like actual sensible numbers um, like so. Okay, so we're looking at 4.1 minus 0.0, .0 or if I go to one more digit of precision, um, something like this. And if I force the intercept, or if I put 0, 0 as a point, then this will change very little with the slope. Um, so let's go in here and format the trend line. Let's force the intercept to 0. and we can also extrapolate backward point um, three or whatever so that it actually goes through the intercept. So notice that the slope changed only from 4.05 to 4.04 by forcing that intercept. Okay, so this one is um, dependent and um, we have something further to do. So. Let's copy this over into our little um, presentation area.
basically what we've got here is uh, because it's linear, uh, the equation is always y equals mx plus b, or, or f of x equals some slope times x plus b, because it's a line. Um, and so basically, this is my period squared. So we use a t for period. So t squared equals slope times length, and then this right here was actually zero, so there's nothing over here. All right, so units of slope. Um, M is always given by rise, so delta Y over run delta X, and so that is a delta of the period squared divided by a delta of the length, and so the units are going to be seconds squared Per meter. Notice that this looks suspiciously like the reciprocal, or in other words, 1 over meters per second squared, which are the units of acceleration. For what it's worth, these are also equivalent to um, gravity field strength, which would be um, which would be 1 over newtons per kilogram. Those are equivalent units to these. All right, so because we see that, we should now be immediately suspicious that gravity field strength is somewhere in the slope. So um, suspicion or, or hypothesis, in other words. I could say suspicion. It's really more like a hypothesis or a conjecture. Um, slope is uh, inversely proportional to g. In other words, m is equal to some number, some constant number, divided by g. Okay. Now, this is about as far as we can go here. We could maybe calculate what the constant number is. Um, but experimentally, I don't have access to a plane to train in lower gravity. The elevators don't um, give you much of an acceleration. The, the acceleration isn't really long enough to time this kind of interaction. And I have no way of getting myself to, say, the Moon or Mars or the International Space Station to alter the value of g. But let's say for the sake of argument that we are able to do such a thing. So then we go out and collect more data. So um, there's basically two ways of doing that. One is that if you have the ability to go to all these locations or if you have the ability on the plane to go to a bunch of different values of g. You'd maybe um, go to your control values of 0.75 meters and um, 35 grams and 6 degrees, or in other words, 0 0.105 radians. And you would just repeat this experiment at a bunch of different values for the gravity field strength and you could plot that and see do you get an inverse relationship and when you've linearized it do you end up with units of basically length. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is instead of making a whole new measurement of uh, g versus uh, uh, period you could duplicate these length measurements that we've done here. So in other words, that's kind of akin to copying all of this um, and then getting for ourselves a different value of the free fall acceleration. So instead of 9.8 on the Earth, maybe you're, you get on to Mars and it's a third of that, or the Moon where it's a sixth of that, or maybe you get into a plane and go into free fall. Um, or, or not free fall, but a downward acceleration such that your effective uh, g 
has different values. So maybe you duplicate this with g equals 4.9, and maybe you also duplicate it um, a second time with g equals, say, um, 2.45, or in other words, a quarter of this value. So if there's an inverse proportionality, what you would expect is that when you take the data, you'd end up with double the periods uh, squared for all of these and quadruple it for all of these. Okay, so in, if there's not an inverse proportionality, then these periods don't double, they would do something else. Okay, so let's say that we go do the experiment and this is what happens. I'm going to pause it and change the data to reflect what actually would happen. Alright, so I've um, altered it uh, according to what we would see. What I'm going to do here now is add the data to these two plots. Um, and so basically what you do is you just add a couple of series, uh, one for each of the um, two new values of G. Uh, so this one for the X's, again, here's the lengths that we used for the Y values. Here is what the period would represent, or here's what the period would be measured as. Um, now, do for the one down here, um, and for X values, again, here's the lengths, and for the Y values, again, here is the average period. Um, and so you end up with three uh, sets of data, and then in here, you can do the same thing um, with the data ranges by uh, basically just adding again to series and let's add and pick and once we've done that we will have three sets of hopefully linear data um, whose oops I picked the wrong thing um, whose slopes will now reflect uh, our hypothesis. All right. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and put this here. Let's add in our trend lines for each set of uh, data. And we've been extrapolating backwards by 0.3, so okay. And this one right here, let's format it. All right, so after all of the formats and everything like that, we end up with these three plots on this one graph. Um, so uh, basically, we're ready now to extract the equation. So let's, uh, whoops. Uh, let's try that again. So here's what the um, sort of test of the hypothesis is. And our question is, um, is this slope inversely proportional to G? So looking at this, um, this one right here went with 9.8. We halved it to 4.9, we got roughly double the slope. 8.07 is roughly 2 times 4.04. Okay, and then we halved it again, and now we have 16.15, which again is basically double of 8.07, and is basically 4 times 4.04. So our hypothesis here um, from this graph that we've made checks out. Okay. So this means that we should be able to use any one of these graphs. Presumably we would want to use the one that we actually um, took first. Uh, but any one of these graphs we should be able to use. We now have that M does in fact 
equals some number over g. So m was 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter. Okay, and so we have simultaneously m is 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter, and m is equal to some number. Let's let's use a capital K. Uh, as the generic constant. So m is k divided by g. Okay, put these two things together. You have k divided by g is equal to 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter. All right, that means that g should be equal to whatever the constant is divided by 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter. Um, or, or alternatively, and, and where we really want to go with this is, k is 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter times g, uh, which was 9.8. So 4.04 .04 seconds squared per meter times 9.8 meters per second squared. So of course the units cancel as we would expect them to and our constant, uh, let's put into our calculator, uh, 9.8 times 4.04 .04 is 39.592. So 39.592. 592. Okay, for what it's worth, um, if I take this number and divide by 10, uh, excuse me, if I take this number and divide by 4, um, I end up getting, so k over 4, 9.898. If I take the square root of that, So take the square root, I get 3.146 something, but these are really the significant figures. So note that what I've done is I've taken k, I've taken a square root, and I've divided by 4. So that means that basically we think that k is 4 pi squared, or in other words, 2 pi quantity squared is a good approximation. Okay, so our uh, total equation that we've gotten out of this, remember that we had t squared is m times l. That's the same thing as saying, so this is equal to k l over g take a square root of both sides, now you have t is equal to square root of k, square root of l over g, and then knowing that k is actually this thing squared, that means that the square root of k is roughly 2 pi, and then that's times square root l over g. So we have obtained for ourselves an equation that describes what the period of the pendulum is going to do as a function of the length and of the free fall acceleration. And we've also eliminated the other two possible um, independent variables. So if I came over here and put like checks next to things that it depends on, it depends on this. It depends on this, it does not depend on this, it does not depend on this. Okay, but overall what we've done here is we have, def um, we have for ourselves obtained a value for the equation, basically a complete equation for period as a function of our independent variables and we've done this from our graphs. So this is the basic procedure for doing um, that.
So this video has run a bit longer than I would have liked for it to have, but it is thorough enough. I've walked you through all the steps and I hope that you find this helpful. Um, this is a sort of a skill in some sense that you're going to be using in one way or another for physics one and for physics two. And then if you happen to be an engineering major or a physics major, a chemistry major, or something like that, you're going to be using this skill a bit more beyond just this first um, physics class or first physics sequence. So I think it's a useful skill and it's a skill that just doesn't get covered in much depth in most classes, hence why feel like investing the time to make this video for you all. So um, that's all that I have for today's video. Hopefully you've learned something from it and um, hopefully you find it helpful. Thank you for watching everyone and goodbye.